Being close enough into the mic. There we go. That's better. All right. Good. Everyone can hear me in the back. Cool. Let's get started. Hi. If you don't know me yet, you do now. My name is Gabe Hollenby. I am a technical evangelist. I work for AWS. Who doesn't know what AWS is? Do I need to spend any time explaining AWS to any of you? Perfect. Cool. Uh, who doesn't know what a tech evangelist is? Cool. I am a software engineer who has the very lucky job of getting to stand up in front of all of you lovely people at places like this and show you how to build cool stuff with AWS. So I'm a builder. I try and write code every day. I don't always get to. But I'm technical. My background is in software engineering. Uh, but now I don't write production code anymore. I build cool demos and get people excited about you know, what AWS has to offer. That's my job. If you want to keep in touch, Twitter is the best way. That's my handle. Uh, and I would love to hear from any of you uh, on what you think of the presentation today, anything you think I can make clear for future times when I deliver this content. I, I really value that feedback especially. So don't be shy. All right. What we're going to cover today is a few things. I'm going to try and speed it up a little bit because I, I want to be respectful of your time. I've done this talk in the past, and it runs about 40 minutes. But I think what I'm going to do for this one is tone down the AWS stuff a bit because that's not what's super exciting to you all. Nobody's here because they wanted to, I don't think, because I'm here about AWS. I'm going to spend as much time as I can showing Python code and talking about how we're going to do some deep learning using Python. It just happens to run on AWS. I'm going to kick off a demo pretty early on because I want to do a live demo. I think it's more fun that way. If it doesn't work, I've got a backup. But let's do a live demo first. It's going to take a little bit of time. What I'm going to do is train a custom image classifier uh, during this talk in the background. And it doesn't take that actually that long to train. It takes a few minutes to train. It takes a few minutes to actually deploy that to an, uh, an endpoint that I can then pass images to for like live inference. Uh, and so I'd rather than waiting at that point and watching progress bars go by, I'm going to kick that off basically by running a bunch of code uh, in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, then I'll explain some concepts. So then we'll come back to the, the deck. I'll explain what the heck is going on. And then I'll review the, the code with you guys. So it's not just like, oh, wow, Gabe just ran a notebook and it had this. That's not the point of this talk. The point is to show you how you can do this yourself. OK. So uh, what is deep learning? Uh, I'll just set the stage before we, uh, we go and we uh, gather uh, our, our data for our classifier. So deep learning, uh, it falls into the realm of machine learning. What is machine learning? It's simply a way of having computers learn how to do things that are easy for us to do as humans, but hard for us as programmers to explicitly program into computers. Right? Here's some common examples. Self-driving cars, sense of analysis, uh, object detection, facial recognition. Right? These are popular uh, applications of machine learning and specifically of deep learning. And I'll get into what deep learning is in a second. Just to go into one of these in a little bit more detail, object detection. Right? If we say, this is a picture of the Eiffel Tower, and you and I sat down, and, and our job was, how do we write a function to tell me if this is a picture of the Eiffel Tower? We, I mean, we would quit, right? We, there's no way we could actually write code to do that. There's too many pictures of the Eiffel Tower on the internet. Uh, or in the world, or, or possible configurations of ways you could take it. And getting something that was highly performant, it would be too hard for us to do as humans, I, I assert to you. If you have a different opinion, I'd love to hear about it afterwards, but I don't think, I don't think you're right. So convince me otherwise. And that's why we have this thing called deep learning. So machine learning sits at the top. You know what that is now. Under machine learning, uh, there's a technology called neural networks. Right? Neural networks are just a, an application of uh, a way to do computing that's inspired by how our brains work. It's not exactly the same, but it follows a similar model. What's cool about neural networks is that a lot of really smart people in the field have proven that given enough computational power, given enough memory, there is nothing you cannot compute with a neural network style. Right? So anything, all the apps we build, everything, right? And Matteo and Dario's parser, we could do it with a neural network. Anything that you do with your day-to-day -day job, we could do it with a neural network if we had you know, enough inputs and, and outputs and, or you know, computing power to handle it. Deep learning uh, it often uses neural networks. And the, the reason why is because in a neural network, basically, you have these layers of neurons. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later. And data flows through these layers from an input layer, which in the case of like an image would be all the pixels of the image, to an output layer, which in the you know, case of an image classifier would be, here's all the things I know how to classify. This was a picture of the Eiffel Tower. This was a picture of a cat, right? However many things I know about, I'm going to have a bunch of, uh, of numbers on the output layer, one for each class. And hopefully, the one with the highest number 
matches the, what we actually sent in, and that's how we, we decide what was in the image. I have pictures. It'll make more sense when you see pictures. Uh, but it's called deep learning because you have multiple layers in this thing. It's not just input, one layer, output. And it's this magic that kind of happens when you, you stack a bunch of these layers together that computers get really, really good at this stuff. That might sound intimidating, but the truth is you don't need a PhD to do this, and you don't even need a ton of data. We're going to train an image classifier with very few images. And this, this blew my mind, right? Before I got started learning about machine learning and, and deep learning in general, I have this misconception that you need <coughs> amazon size data sets in order to, to do this stuff. Well, you don't, uh, and, and I'll prove it to you. And the cool thing is you don't even need a dedicated team of data science experts to do this either. Uh, any of you who can you know, write a bit of Python can, can do this stuff today. I mean, I'm going to show you how to do this. So the use case I'll, I'll give you is we have a service called Amazon Recognition at AWS. It's really cool. You give it an Im it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is you give it an image and it'll tell you what it thinks is in the image, right? Like, oh, I think there's a skateboarder here. I think it's a sport. There's a human in the in the picture. There's cars, whatever. Um, that's it's really cool and it knows how to recognize a lot of things. But customers come up to me sometimes and they say, I love recognition, but I want to apply it to images that are specific for my domain that recognition doesn't know about, which makes sense, right? Because we can't train a model at AWS that knows everything in the world because we don't have all of the things. You might have uh, specific things in your business domain, right? Like, I want to train it to recognize Gucci versus Prada handbags. I don't know, right? Like, so uh, it might know it's a handbag, for example, but it might not know Gucci or Prada. Um, so if, that's, if that sounds interesting to you and you want to do this for your own domain, what are you left with? Well, you can do it yourself. You can build your own image classifier, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it right now. But first, we need some data. So now I'm going to switch back to my computer, and hopefully we'll get some, uh, some data captured. Now, if I talk to you like this for a minute without the mic, because I need both hands, can you all hear me OK? Awesome. OK. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the computer to decide that it's going to show me a screen. Good. OK. Um, I have two little web apps here. Am I still running it? Yes. Good. All right. So I have a little web app here. It's really simple. It's got a webcam fired up. It's going to capture some pictures of me. I'm going to call this uh, my data set name, PySG. So all this is doing is it's a web app. That, uh, it's going to capture webcam images and put them inside like folders on Amazon S3. S3. Does anyone not know what S3 is? OK, well, for the recording for folks at home, S3 is a service that lets you uh, stick as much data, basically, as you want on the internet at uni unique keys. So it's like a data blob storage service. Uh, and so I'll say human. I want to gather some pictures of human. And it's just going to be me here. Uh, so let me just get some pictures of me here. All right, that's 25. Let me do 30. OK, there's 30 pictures of a human, 31. Let me get rid of one of those. All right. Next, uh, let's just, I don't know how many classes we're going to do. We can do at least two classes. Let's do bottle. So now I'm going to take some pictures of bottle. There's 32. I want to keep it a nice even 30 for this. OK, there's 30. Um, and then, like maybe just for the sake of it, uh, we'll do one more, and I'm just going to call this one clutter. So this will be things that I don't want. You know, if, if it only knows about human and bottles, anything I show it, it's going to be like, oh, that's definitely human, even if it's not, because it has to make a choice at the end of the day between the classes it knows about. So I'll make one more. I'll call it clutter. And we'll just take some pictures of things that are neither humans nor bottles, like, I don't know, just the empty background, right? Or like maybe some stuff of like, I don't know, these, this, this phone cord here, my arm. Uh, and then there, maybe this phone. That's not a bottle. How about my hand? How about uh, this soda can? And I don't know, that's probably enough. Let's see how it works. Um, actually, it'd be nice if there were roughly the same number of images in each one. So I'm going to do a few more. I'm going to do this adapter. 
We're gonna do my bag. Okay. Sorry. Oh, we can do my hat too. Sure. Um, I will. Uh, I'll get rid of some of these ones of this can, and we'll just do just the hat. All right. Fun. That's probably enough. Okay. Cool. So all of these now live on uh, a bucket. Is what we call the place where this data goes on S3. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to train this model. Now, in the, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you how to spin up a Jupyter Notebook in this tool that I'm using, but I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Um, I already have one spun up. I'm using a tool called SageMaker. I'll tell you more about SageMaker in a minute when we get back to the slides. But while we're waiting for Jupyter to open, I'll show you that really what this is is it's a, uh, it's a virtual machine in the cloud that AWS hosts for us, and it comes pre-installed with everything you probably want installed for all of your machine learning and deep learning needs. From a low level, if you're like, if you already know this stuff and you want to just like write some Keras or some TensorFlow or use Gluon or MXNet or any of that stuff, we got it, right? You want SciPy, NumPy, oh, Pandas, it's all there. Um, but it's also, you know, it also gives a hosted Jupyter notebook session, which is nice. So um, now I'm just going to give it a few different uh, a point to a different bucket, and now I'm actually just going to run all these cells. This is the boring part where I'm just, I told you I'm just going to run a bunch of stuff, and then we'll come back and we'll look at this code. Okay. Fingers crossed, prayer to the demo gods, hopefully this is going to work. And Mike, I'm sorry that I just shouted at your volume levels, but hopefully it's OK. OK, that step is done. So following a cooking metaphor, what we've just done is we put something in the oven, right? So now let's, I'm going to teach you about the concepts a bit more. Then we'll actually read the recipe. Well, then we'll look at what's in the oven. Oh, thank you. Then we'll look at what's in the oven. Uh, if it looks good, we'll uh, do a taste test, uh, and hopefully we have something that works. If it doesn't for some reason, uh, I have a, a pre-trained model I did earlier that I can also show you. But it's not as fun. It's always nice to do live demos, right? So what is a neural network in more detail? OK, so a neuron. You can think of a neuron as it's just a thing that holds a number. OK, it's like a cell in some graph. Uh, it could be 0.2, it could be 0.8. It's usually a decimal. Think of them as you know, like just decimal numbers. It's not. Now imagine we wanted to teach a computer how to classify handwritten digits. So this is a classic machine learning example. So in a 28 by 28 pixel image of grayscale, you have 784 numbers that you care about. So for example, these numbers could be like low numbers, like 30 uh, if it's at the edge of the, 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 the drawing, or you know, like 1 if it's right in the middle. It's a really strong line, or maybe somewhere in between, right? In, in machine learning speak, we call this the neuron's activation value. That's just jargon. You don't need to know what that means. Just think about a, a neuron have, is just a node that has a value. Now, we're going to take this image, and we're going to like stick it all in a line. right? We're going to line up all the pixels. Uh, and that becomes the first layer of some kind of network. In this case, this is a network that has two middle layers. Uh, we, sometimes you call those the hidden layers. Uh, and then at the final stage, we have this output layer, right? Now, the, the output layer has one node per class of what we're interested in classifying. So in this case, we want to classify the digits 0 through 9. So we're going to have 10 cells, 10 nodes in our output layer. And what's going to happen is all the numbers from this 9, right, that, that became the, this, this first layer of input, are going to go through this network, and some simple math is going to happen. And at the end of all that simple math, there's going to be numbers here on this side. And hopefully, the number that, in this case for 9, the, the number in the 9 node there is going to be really high, and the number for all the other ones is going to be really low. And that's how the computer is going to decide there's a 9 there. Now, how? How does that happen, right? OK, well, before I get to that, let's just recap Like, what, what is a neural network? Neurons are just nodes with a value. They're linked to these other nodes with various connection strengths. So before, you just saw lines. But those lines, you could think of them as like being thick or being thin. Uh, and those connection strengths can vary. And based on the connection strengths and something else called a bias, you'll get, that's how the computation is going to hopefully you know, end up with being valuable for whatever our domain is. Um, the bias is just 
another value that, that is going to determine if that node is excited or not, right? I like to think of this like uh, like a joke, right? Like you imagine all these neurons are all lined up in a row, and some of them whisper to other people, other ones, and then they whisper down the chain, and the the. The joke goes in one end, and the, some neurons have a sense of humor, and they think it's funny, and they're going to pass the joke on. And some neurons think it's not so funny, and they're going to decide, no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not passing, I'm not telling my friends this joke. It's not funny. That's what the bias is. It's like, you know, how how giggly are you essentially, right? So in a simple example, uh, imagine that we just had a two-pixel image, and and we had a one-node network. This literally doesn't make much sense, but I wanted to illustrate the math in an exp explicit example. So if we have values of, and I'm using integers here because integer math is easier for me. So you have a 1 and a 5 values going into this node with weights of 2 and 3 and a bias of negative 4 means we're going to do 1 times 2 plus 5 times 3 plus negative 4 and we get a value of 13, right? Literally that's like in its simplest form, that's what's going on here. And it's just a lot of that chained together makes the magic happen. I'm simplifying a little bit, but this is like, at least 80% what you need to know in order to, to really just understand that it's not really magic, it's just a lot of math happening really, really quickly, really fast over and over again. Okay, but how does the network learn, right? Because what we could do is just keep trying random connection strengths of all the various you know, combinations uh, until we get one that works, right? This is like a million monkeys and a million typewriters and you wait infinitely long and you eventually get Hamlet. Yes, but that's not what we're going to do here because uh, you know the, the sun would explode probably before we finish this computation. There's a better way. So in this example, let's say we're trying to feed a, a two through the network, right? Here's what's going to happen: the two goes through the network, and you know the network starts out with some amount of, of weights and biases. Just think of them like being random. And then at the end of flowing through the first time, the network is going to suck at it; it has no idea what it's doing. And you're going to end up with values like this, right? Just for example, where some of the values are, are going to be uh, really low and some are going to be really high. But to change these, the end results, all we can do is adjust the weights and the biases. So you can see here, what we wanted to do was get the, the number in the two slot really high, right? We know it needs to go up and it needs to go up by a lot. And we know that these other ones that are not two all need to go down. Now, some need to go up by a lot based on the current values. Some need to go up or down, you know, get nudged a lot. Some need to get nudged a little bit. That nudging, however, you know, the factor of how much you need to nudge in what direction, lets you, uh, with some clever algorithms that you don't need to write because they've already been done for you, uh, basically start going backwards from each of these nodes and knowing how you want to change them and adjusting backwards through the network. That's called back propagation. That's just another jargon term. And th th I've just described for you what's going on there. It's, it's not really complicated. I mean, sure, there's some math involved, and, and you could figure it out if you needed to. But again, you don't, because all these deep learning libraries already do that for you. So let's recap. We start by randomly initializing our, uh, our weights and our biases once at the very beginning. Then we're going to send every training example through the network. Uh, and we're going to measure the difference between what we wanted to see uh, in terms of like the each output node and what we actually saw. And then we're going to go backwards through the network, adjusting the weights and the biases. And we're going to redo it. And we're going to do this over and over and over again a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of times, hopefully honing in on networks that perform better and better and better. And at some point, we'll stop because uh, either we've decided we want to stop for based on how much time we're training for, or because it, the, the network stopped improving. It got to a, a point where it's like, ah, you could keep going, but I'm already good enough. Finally, we're going to run some validation examples through the network. So this is different data than what we trained the network on. Uh, and that's because you don't want the network to effectively memorize your images only, right? You want it to generalize certain features about those images. Uh, something I didn't explicitly say before that I think is worth touching on, this is the cool power of, of deep learning here. In classic machine learning workloads, there's a feature step called feature, I'm sorry, there's a step called feature engineering. That is usually what you have a team of really smart data scientists for, right? You've got some data like uh, credit card uh, fraud rates, and then you have a bunch of transactions, and then you know a team of data scientists goes away and they look at it and they go, we have 30 attributes about transactions, and we figured out that these are the ones that are relevant for predicting uh, if something's going to be fraudulent or not. So let's train a model on that. Figuring that out and like how you need to tweak your data before you feed it to the machine learning algorithm, that's called feature engineering. Deep learning gets a, it does away with all that. You don't need to do feature engineering because the network figures it out the features for you. 
if that makes sense. Now, there's another thing specifically used in the field of image recognition that I think is worth calling out here, and that's something called a, a convolution. Jargon alert, it's actually not complicated to understand, but you might have heard this term convolutional neural networks specifically in the field of image recognition. A convolution just means let's examine neighboring pixels together. Okay? So uh, in this example, we've got, let's look at this image and let's look at all of the eight images, uh, or, or, or pixel, sorry, pixels around it, and let's do some math on that, right? And so up here we have a matrix. Uh, it's basically just like a map, right, that says take the, the pixel I'm looking at, the one in the middle there, and you know, multiply it by eight. Take all the surrounding pixels and multiply them by negative one, add all of that up, and you get a new value. And so this, this is called a, a kernel, a convolutional kernel. Just think of it like a little map, right? It tells you what to do. It's the transformation. This kernel uh, ends up giving you something that looks like an outline of an image. Do you remember like the first time you ever saw like, uh, you know, in Photoshop, you could run those filters and you could just say like, uh, you know, find me the outline of the image or, or you know, sharpen this image. And I, I used to think like, wow, how does it do that? It's actually really simple math. Like you could, you could yourself, any of us probably could sit down and program a computer how to do that, right? It's, that's, that's neat. I never knew it was that simple, but it is. So what's cool about this is with, with some very simple math again, the computer can figure out how to see the image in different ways that might be enlightening in order to help classify the image better. I have a video of this in action too, so you can see more of what I mean. So as we move the mouse around, uh, you can see that it's sampling the uh, pixel in the middle and uh, showing you all the, the math involved for how it's, getting, uh, how it's translating those images into new values uh, on the right-hand side. So for example, that kernel gives you something that like, finds the outline of an image, sharpen. You know, that just means let's use 5 for the middle value, negative 1 for like the north, south, east, and west, and ignore the diagonals, and you get this like sharpened image if you were. You can also do ones to figure out like the left edges of an image or the right edges in the image, etc. So the point here is we don't just look at the pixels one at a time. We could do that, but there's more information in the 2D context of an image specifically. And so when you're building image uh, recognizers, you, you want that. This is the cool magic of convolutional neural networks. You layer these convolutional layers together. So um, in each layer, you could think of the layer being responsible for deciding on a particular kernel configuration. And then you have several of those kernel configurations kind of pipelining, transforming that image all the way through. After one layer, networks know about contrasts and similarities. After two layers, they know about things like lines, circles, gradients. After three layers, they know about things like Text is a thing. Human shapes are a thing, right? They don't know what it says, but they know like that, that's a class of things that I see. By five layers, they know I can recognize dog heads versus cat heads. I can recognize bicycle wheels as a thing. Eyes of animals, the centers of flowers. It gets really specific really quickly. It feels like magic. It's not magic. It's just a lot of math. So. How do we make our own custom image classifier in 21 lines of code? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit, I'm, I'm playing a little bit loosey-goosey with this 21 lines of code number. You can look at my Jupyter notebook later and count for yourself. The reason why is some of the lines, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm being more expressive than I could be otherwise. You could code golf this in even less lines than 21. Um, and a lot of these lines are going to be data configuration, not actually doing training. But let's go look. Um, I'm going to come back to this the, the, if we have time. If we don't have time, I will just quickly say AWS has a lot of services covering all stacks of machine learning that you might want to run. On the top layer, we have services that are fully baked for you. So if you don't want to train your own networks for anything, but you want to make lifelike speech, we have Poly. You want to recognize images and, and video, uh, we have Amazon Recognition Image and Video. You want to take what I'm saying right now and turn it into text, even live streaming, we have Amazon Transcribe. We have Comprehend, et cetera. So you can go look at all those. On the other total side of things is like, I know exactly what I'm doing with deep learning networks, Gabe. I already know this stuff. I want to use TensorFlow. I have this opinion. I want to use PyTorch. I want to use Keras, all that kind of stuff. You're a machine learning practitioner all the way through already. We have uh, really great virtual machines with very, very fast GPUs uh, that can be elastically scaled to, for, at your workloads. And so we serve you. 
What I care about is actually this middle layer, right, where we have SageMaker. So SageMaker is our service that makes it really easy to build, train, and deploy your models uh, in, in, a, in a way that makes it accessible for uh, what I would say is probably most of us in the room, right? I'm not a deep learning expert. I'm a programmer. I know how to write Python. I know how to take data, get it sh into the shape that some function wants. Uh, so that's basically what SageMaker gives you. So SageMaker gives you a few things, but what we're going to show is it comes with a lot of built-in algorithms. So you might not know all of the, uh, the different you know, algorithms for deep learning out there, but you might have heard some of these things before. XGBoost, right, or, or uh, uh, k-means clustering, or random forest cuts, et cetera. And if you don't, our documentation will tell you. It'll say things like, if you have a problem that you, know, you need a discrete answer, look at these built-in things. If you have a problem that doesn't, know, so there's good docs to help you. You don't need to know ahead of time, right, I want to use this algorithm. But one of the built-in algorithms that SageMaker has is, you want to make an image classifier? We got that for you. All you need to do uh, is give us some data. So this is what we did in our Jupyter Notebook. And now let's go back and let's look at the, the notebook, and we'll review the code a bit more. Oh, and we'll see if it actually finished building. It should have, unless there was some error for some reason. OK, the moment of truth. Good, this is good. If we see lots of output here, that looks good. OK, cool. I did something. Let's review the code. I'm going to make this bigger. Is that big enough for everyone in the back? Hands up if it's good. Good, thank you. OK, so what's going on here? First, we need to configure our training data, right? A lot of this stuff is going to be about that. So you know, I am going to pull up a chair because I'm going to sit here for a few minutes. OK, um, we're going to basically put our images in different directories, one per class. I hope that makes sense to everyone. That's what my tool did, and it automatically uploaded them to these like subfolders on our S3 object service. So here we've just defined, OK, where, what's the, my bucket name? Uh, I'm not going to win any awards on bucket names, but that's because I generated one randomly. Uh, and uh, what's my data set name, or like my subfolder in there where all the images went? So inside PySG, we have a folder for face, we have a folder for, uh, or for human, rather. We have one for bottle, we have one for clutter. Next, we're going to do some things. We're going to import our SageMaker Python uh, module here, and we're going to uh, import a couple other things. Role and sesh are just variables we're going to use later on. I'm not even going to explain what they are, but uh, you, can, uh, you can read the docs if you really care. You'll, you'll be able to infer from the context. Training image, don't let this mislead you. This doesn't mean an image like a, a you know, with pixels. This is a, a, a container image, like a Docker container. And that's because behind the scenes, SageMaker is powered by containers. And so the, the built-in image classifier algorithm that comes with SageMaker is just a uh, pre-built Docker container that you're pointing SageMaker at. So point being, if you have your own machine learning uh, or deep learning uh, workflow already done, and you just want to leverage the other things that SageMaker brings to the table, like parallel training, without uh, you know, like automatic elastic scaling parallel training, or model hosting and deployment, uh, but you've got your own you know, algorithm written, you just need to containerize it up and point SageMaker at that. We've just done that work for you for a lot of common workloads. So this training image just gets me the image uh, on our Elastic Container Registry that the algorithm happens to be at for image classification. OK, so I'm going to use a script here called m2rec.py. Uh, what this is is a script that will take my folders of images and convert them into different files for me. And this is because I looked at the docs for the image classifier algorithm in SageMaker, and it said, you can pass me images directly on S3, or you can pass me something called a record I.O. format. You, the option is yours. And I said, OK, well, I want to show people the harder thing, because it's not actually hard to do. Uh, and it's worth knowing how to do it in case you ever want to make record I.O. files. So a record I.O. file is basically just a one binary file that has all of your training data in it. And it also has the class data that, that says, right, this, these are my faces or my humans, right, these are my bottles, et cetera. Uh, and it's a way that makes it very efficient for loading and distributing uh, uh, deep learning workloads like this. So. Uh, all of this ceremony, I'm just going to set some environment variables here. And then all this is just saying, OK, I want to find this file in my path, right? Where, is, where m2rec.py exists inside Python's path? And I'll store that as an environment variable also. OK, now we're going to pull our training images from S3. This is me just using the AWS command line interface uh, to uh, say sync a local file uh, directory with my bucket. And now I'm going to make my, uh, my, my record I.O. files. So to make a record I.O. file with uh, m2rec, there's two steps, the same script as both. 
And I read the documentation right here, and that's how I learned about it. By the way, this notebook, at the end of my presentation, I have a link to it, so you can play around with this yourself, of course. Um, first up, you make uh, something called a list file. A list file is just a file that says, for every file that you're going to use for your training, right? this is the file name, effectively. This is the path on S3 plus what class it is. So it's just a metadata file that describes all of, all of the files and what class each of those, these images in, in, in this case. Then the record IO file bundles that up into one big binary. Right? So you use this tool twice uh, to generate the two files. And th there's the, the command line arguments are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and excuse me. And the documentation is pretty good. I should not have gone backwards, but luckily Jupyter notebooks keep all the output states, so we can just keep going. All right. Um, after that's done, uh, there's some cleanup, but I don't need to clean up because it's already cleaned up. And now we're ready to upload. So this is me just doing more stuff. So here I'm saying in this session variable that we did at the top, which gave me a default SageMaker session, this is a Bodo session. If you've worked with S3 or sorry with uh, AWS before uh, using Python, um, so this is th that sesh was just a Bodo uh, client session object. And so from that, it knows a bucket that it wants to work with uh, for you know, that SageMaker has permissions to, to read and write data from and to. And so I'm going to say, where do I want my data to go in this bucket that I'm going to point SageMaker at? And I'm going to put it there. That's all this is doing. It's not very exciting. OK. Uh, here's where it really gets interesting. This is where I'm going to say, all right, uh, I'm basically making a data channels uh, object, right? It's just a dictionary that has training data and validation data. So this is the fact that what I've neglected to mention before, I'm sorry, is that the M2Py script, I told it, use 70% of my images for training and 30% for test. And so it even takes care of splitting those for you. I thought I was going to have to write all that code, but I didn't. So that's great. That's one reason right there. If you need to do this kind of stuff, you want to use M2Rec because it'll, it'll do that for you. So now that we know what data is going to be for training and for test, because we ended up with two uh, record I.O. files at the end of what we ran above, now it's time to train. So here's where it gets really fun. So I'm using something called a SageMaker estimator. Uh, how did I know to write this code? So um, what I haven't showed you, and this is a good quick segue, SageMaker uh, in the Jupyter notebooks that come with it when you spin up a notebook instance, it comes with a ton of example notebooks for you to look at for all kinds of use cases. right? So let me just move this a little bit so you can see. We've got introduction to machine learning in, in a bunch of different contexts, but then we have all the built-in algorithms, right? Introductions to all those that SageMaker can do. And even inside image classification, there's like 10 different examples here that, that highlight different ways of doing things depending on what you're interested in, right? Do you want to use like 30 GPU or like you know, 30 nodes in parallel training? We have an example for that. Do you want to uh, do it with list file instead of record IO file? We have that. Do you want to do transfer learning, which is what I'm doing, and I'll explain what that is in a minute? We've got that. So I actually started my notebook from this example, and then I forked it to, to show a bit more uh, because I wanted it to be a, li a little bit more explicit than what the, the default notebook comes with. So, um, and then there's documentation for this too. You can look at the Python SageMaker SDK, and it will explain you know, what's inside this estimator class and what you can give it. So all you give it is, right, what's the Docker image I'm building from? Uh, that role variable that we set at the top, uh, what's that? This is so cool. This train instance count equals one. If I have a lot of data, I don't have a lot of data. I'm, I'm totally overkilling this. But if I had a, a whole, whole, whole lot of data and I wanted to train on more than one virtual machine in the cloud, I just change this one. I could change it to 10. I could change it to 100. I could change it to 2,000. And it will parallelize my training. You don't have to set up any of this infrastructure. Please don't spend time doing that. It, that's why SageMaker is so cool. I can just parallelize my training with literally just changing integer value here. This next variable says, uh, what type of machine do I want to train on? I'm using our latest generation uh, virtual machines, our P3 instances. I'm using the weakest one, which is called a 2x large. This machine costs $3.06 <coughs> US per hour in the region I'm running it in. That's not very much money at all, uh, for especially for what you get. So this machine has, uh, I believe, you know, don't quote me on this. It has at least one uh, Tesla V100 GPU. It might have more than one. Uh, we can look at the specs later. It's a really beefy GPU. I didn't explicitly mention this yet because I, I, this is an assumed piece of knowledge, but I should say, if you don't know this about deep learning especially and machine learning in general, it requires a lot of math, right? Well, GPUs are really good at math. And so all the training that you're probably going to end up doing or you hear people talking about doing requires lots of powerful GPUs. You don't want to buy that hardware. That's the advantage of the cloud. You're only going to you know, let AWS buy that hardware and maintain it. And you only pay for it while you're using it. And then you don't pay for it anymore. 
OK, and where should the model go after we're done, right, in this S3 allocation, output location? So it's going to get the data from S3, train a model, put a model back on S3. We're going to set some hyperparameters, jargon alert. Hyperparameters just means config. I really wish back when they were like coming up with the jargon here, they just called it config. But I guess hyperparameters makes you sound smarter, so they went with that. Um, I guess they were thinking, the data that goes into my machine learning training, that's the parameters of my, of my algorithm. So what about the configuration? Well, that's parameters about the parameters, so we'll call it hyperparameters. It's just jargon. So there's two types of hyperparameters that I think are worth dis, uh, drawing a distinction between. The ones that you don't want to mess with in this case and the ones that you do. So what don't we want to mess with? Well, we don't want to mess with these. Use pre-trained model equals one. This means uh, do transfer learning. And I learned this by reading the documentation. Because I, 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 when I first got into this, I didn't even know that SageMaker's image classifier algorithm does transfer learning. What is transfer learning? This is the magic that lets you train networks without a lot of data. In this case, they're taking a network that was trained already to classify many, many th tens of thousands of different types of, of things in the world. And you take that same network that's already trained all the weights and biases for how to recognize dogs and cats and fish and you know uh, people and, and whatever, like tens of thousands of things. And all it does is it takes that knowledge and applies those same weights and biases to your data, right? So it's just solving for that last layer in the training now. It doesn't have to mess with all those previous layers. So you could also think of transfer learning as the feature engineering from the network was already done for you. It knows all the relevant things, of, in this case, about what we might see out in the real world. And it's going to use, it's going to bring that knowledge to bear on the images for our domain. What might we want to mess with? Well, some magic numbers here, like the learning rate and the mini batch size. This is more jargon for you. Learning rate is just a number that represents how much should I be nudging my network by when I'm trying to, to do successive iterations. Uh, mini batch size means how many images should I be feeding through, in this case images, should I be feeding through my network uh, before I kind of look at it holistically and say, uh, did, it learn, did it learn well or not? How much should I nudge my weights by, rinse, repeat? You can learn all this with more resources that I'm going to give you at the end of this talk. So don't worry if it didn't make a whole lot of sense. The point is, these numbers are good to mess with and will give you a, a model that performs better or worse. So you could be silly like I was when I first got into this and start training your model over and over and over again, trying to get better performance by manually tweaking these numbers. But we have a why. That's what computers are good for. So SageMaker also has a feature called hyperparameter tuning or automatic model tuning, which you say, these are the hyperparameters that I'm interested in you messing with, SageMaker. Go and train x times, right? where x could be any number you want. Like You could say, go, tra go run 500 training sessions messing with these variables, and then tell me which model performed the best. Perfect. Now I have the best trained model, and I know which, which parameters gave it that, that, the best model. So if I want to play a little bit more around that space, I could. Uh, and so these are this kind of all the, the, the hyperparameters that go in. And now we train our model. Training is just as easy as basically saying, Take that image classifier object I made and call fit on it. Pass it the data channels that said, here's our training data, here's your test data. I give it a job name if you want. I want to see my, my logs. And then these are variables here, uh, just so I can see some stuff at the end. And here's the logs. Now, I'm not going to read all the logs to you because that's not really fun. Uh, but what you can see here is there's some preamble stuff where it says, OK, I'm getting ready to go. Uh, here's all my parameters, so I have that. And then it starts training. And what you can see here is the very beginning, it trained, and its first accuracy was only 0.45, it's like 45% accurate on the, on, the, on the data for the training set. Not very good. But then it also ran it through the validation accuracy, and it's, uh, it was 88% accurate. OK. Well, and then it just rinses and repeats, right? It keeps going over and over and over again. Each one of these things, every time it runs through all of the images, in this case, five at a time, because my mini batch size was five, every time it goes through all the images, that's called one epic. So it does this over and over and over again. And as you can see very quickly, it starts performing much better. Validation accuracy, one, one, you know, 100%. Training accuracy, 0 0.91. Uh, validation accuracy here, um, 0.96. And you know it goes for a while, and it, it starts honing in on, on something that's uh, it's really, really, really good. In this case, it ends up being you know 1.0 1 for training and for validation uh, at the end, which is awesome. So this is the line I want to draw your attention to, 194 billable seconds. So remember before I said this instance I was training on was $3.06 an hour? Well, we only use 194 seconds of that, right? So what is that? That's 306 cents per hour. Uh, divided by 60 minutes an hour, divided by 60 seconds in a minute, times 194 seconds, uh, is 16 and a half US cents to train our custom image classifier. 
Come on, guys. That's like that's such good value. You have no reason, no excuse not to be playing with this stuff, um, in my opinion, because that's cheap. And then now that I have a model trained, what do I do with it? Well, it really is. It's just a. There, it's a bunch of files inside a, a gzip file uh, on S3 that if you unzip this, you'll see it's, there's like it's some JSON. It says, here's what your network looks like. Here are the weights and the values. And then basically something is going to load that into a you know, programmatic representation of that network so that it can feed data through it. Um, hosting this yourself, not hard. You could do it. But again, you probably want something that's going to be highly available. Uh, and scalable and, and secure. And those are things that are not unique to your domain, and you probably shouldn't be worrying about those. So why not let SageMaker host the model for you? And that's what it'll do. So with one more line, image classifier.deploy, and I'll say I want one uh, virtual machine to, to host my endpoint to start with, uh, it will, it'll spin that up for me. Now, what's important to note here is look at this. I'm using a different instance class type here. This is a T2 medium. This is a very, very cheap, relatively low powered CPU and low memory uh, virtual machine in the cloud. Costs a lot less than $3 an hour, I'll tell you that. Uh, we could go look, but it's, it's not very much money at all. And the point being, training your models, you want GPUs, which costs a little bit more money. Hosting your models, oftentimes, you don't even need a GPU on the box. You can just do the inference uh, on a CPU only. You'll always get better performance if you use GPUs, but you often don't need to, depending on what you're doing. OK, it's deployed. Now it's time for the candy. Let's test this out, right? Um, here is the endpoint name. And now we plug this into my other tool. Thank you for bearing with me for this. OK, uh, my other tool is localhost port 3001. And I'm going to say my endpoint name is that. And my classes were what? Clutter and bottle. And this needs to go in alphabetical order. Bottle, clutter, and human, right? OK. Here we go. Classify me. Hopefully this works. Good, it thinks I'm a human. Can you guys all see that number in the bottom there? 0.94% um, certain that I'm a human there. Not bad for literally 30 images for each training set. Um, and you can see here, it definitely didn't think it was a bottle or clutter. Those numbers are really low. Let's just do another one. Now, for another one, I'd like to volunteer from the audience. And I'd like somebody who looks substantially different from me. And you'll, 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 maybe you'll see why in a minute. So can I have somebody come up who doesn't look like me, i.e. not a white guy? Anyone, please? Sure. Thank you. Come here. Just stick yourself in front of the webcam here, and then click that <coughs> classify button, please. And then just yeah, click, click there. OK, thank you. All right, now it thinks he's a human too, which is good. Uh, he looks human to me. Are you human? <laughs> good. Uh, um, but as you can see, it's a lot less confident, right? It, this has a 0.82% confidence score, or 82% rather. That's not as high. Quick little side note, right? When you train your models, there is bias. You, it, it's very important that your model is only as good as the data you put into it. Garbage in, garbage out. We already know this from all the code we write. It's the same for deep learning. It's not so magic that it's going to know every, what every human looks like. It knows some of the features that make up a human, especially for white guys wearing hats. Let's see how it does without my hat on. See, 0.62. Right, Because all of my training images, I had the hat on too. So again, you want a, a variety of samples of data. I intentionally didn't collect that during the, the training set so I could show you that it doesn't do as well when you, you, know, when you bias your data. But sorry, is there a hand up? I'm sorry? Can you put a bottle on yourself? Oh, yes, yeah, so we'll get to that. I wanted to try the other ones too. Everybody always asks this too. It's the best part. But first, let's just do one with a bottle so we can see how it does with bottle. And we'll do a clutter one and see how it does with clutter. And then uh, we'll, we'll try some other fun things. Now, that's a bottle that it was trained with, right? It saw that bottle before. Let's use an Evian bottle, which is different. And let's try and like give it like, oh, I'm dripping water on my computer. That's not good. Amazon won't like that. Um, let's try it at a different angle too, like a really sharp angle, maybe down. OK. Let's see how it did. Bottle, uh, point, uh, so 98% bottle, 69% bottle, 55% clutter. So see, it didn't do very good with the bottle head on. Again, I didn't take any images with the bottle head on, uh, so that's not surprising. So you want some variety of data. but. 
it do, it's still pretty amazing. What I wanted to show was it can perform very well with transfer learning, even without a lot of data. Um, let's do one with a bottle over my face, because that was requested. OK, I've given you a few different looks. There's bottle in the middle of face. It thinks bottle. There's a bottle way in front of obscuring my face, except my shoulders. It's definitely bottle, 97%. There's a bottle covering m half my face, bottle 69%. There's a bottle to the side of my face. So for whatever reason, it decided if it sees a face and it sees a bottle, both clearly, it's going to pick bottle. And you can train classifiers to do multi-object detection. That's not what we did here. But you can do that, right? So it's not like that. It can't, you can't, it can't do that. You can. Uh, it's available. For the purposes of this demo, we were only teaching it how to recognize like the main thing or one thing in the image, if you were. Uh, let me just do one more with clutter. Hold on. And let's give it clutter it's never seen before also, um, like this microphone pack. Just to see. Clutter. See, it thought that was a bottle. So again, not, but only 50% confident. So the other thing I just want to mention here before we move on, you don't just want to say, OK, right? Because you'll see, we get back the scores for every class, right? And, and it's up to the consumer of that data to decide what to do with it. You don't just want to blindly say, OK, take the, the highest score. That must be what it is. Depending on your case, you probably want some threshold, right? Where if I'm not confident enough about it, I'm not going to do something with it. Or I'm going to have a human manually review it. And then maybe I'll feed that data back in and train again so it's even better, right? You can do all these things. Really important uh, to take. To, to never, depending on your use case, um, if it's really important, like you're doing uh, uh, something that's really critical, you don't want to get wrong, you want to have a very high uh, threshold. So you're only going to consider you know, maybe 0.98 or 0.99. Uh, and if it's really, 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 really critical, uh, you probably never want the machine to be the only thing that makes the decision, right? Um, like, I don't want to have a, a robot that's going to shoot people ever. But if you were making something like that, you probably also want a human being to decide it's time to shoot your tear gas at the person uh, instead of the computer doing it all on its own, right? Because that's just always a good idea when you're messing with humans. More questions? OK, so the question is, uh, my, my training data set was quite balanced. I had 30 images of a human, 30 of a bottle, and then a few of random types of clutter. Have I tried something where it was maybe five images of a bottle and 30 images of a human and see how it did? I haven't tried that. I would encourage you to try it and report back to the group and see how it goes. <laughs> Then, then I don't imagine the results are going to be any different when I do it in, up in front of you here. So a good piece of advice, try and have balanced data sets when you can, because your models will have an easier time learning from that. I have a bit more stuff I want to cover, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. That's not my clicker. This is. OK. So we tried it. It worked. Thank you, demo gods. Um, I'm always happy when that works. Just want to wrap up by saying, look, uh, I work for AWS. It's important for me to tell you more machine learning workloads run on AWS than anywhere else in the cloud. I don't have enough room on slides anymore to show you the logos from all of our cool customers doing awesome things uh, with machine learning workloads on AWS. Um, but we can talk about just a few of them. Take Expedia, Hotels.com, for example. Right? What they realized was some images uh, of hotel rooms uh, are really good for getting people to book, and some are not so good. <laughs> And so they trained uh, models using transfer learning, the same concept that, that we did today, uh, to help them predict uh, which, uh, which types of images would, would convert better. All right. Here's another one, Grammarly. I see ads for Grammarly all the time. I think it's a pretty cool service. If you're not familiar with it, it is a service that will watch what you type uh, and then suggest you know, how ways to make it more clear. Uh, Grammarly uh, uses TensorFlow, which is one of the popular uh, deep learning training uh, toolkits out there. And they 
I liked uh, working with SageMaker on AWS because of, of the thing I told you before, uh, the, uh, the elastic uh, distributed training, rather. So you just say, I don't want one node, I want however many you need because you have a bigger data set and, and you don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure yourself. So Grammarly had a, a lot of uh, positive things to say about that. Um, and then also after running the, uh, the training the model using SageMaker, as I mentioned, you can use SageMaker to run the inference yourself, but you can also take that model that I told you about before, that gzip file, you can download it, you can put it on iOS, you can put it on Android, uh, and you know, or on a local machine, and have a client library there. Because again, it's just weights and numbers representing the shape of the, and the shape of the network. And so with a client library that knows how to parse that, it can then just feed data through the same way that the endpoint does. There's no magic there. Okay, so where can I learn more? If you want to learn more, here's, here's your link dump. Um, this is the slide to take a picture of if you want to, well, there's two. You should also take a picture of my contact info so you can follow up with more questions afterwards. But this is the one you definitely want. Okay, those cool animations I showed you before, they're by a guy named Grant Sanderson. He's amazing. These were used with his permission because I saw them in, when I was learning this stuff and I said, these are the best videos I've seen on deep learning. Can I show them to more people? And he said, yes, please do. So he goes by the handle three blue, one brown. He has a series on YouTube called uh, Understanding uh, Neural Networks. That's 60 minutes total watching time for, for each part, like together, total. So if you have an hour over the course of one or two lunch breaks, watch this. It's amazing. There's no better explanation you'll find in 60 minutes, in my opinion. If you want more than an hour, uh, fast.ai as, as an online course, they cover a lot more stuff. But the idea is it's about practical applications of machine learning. Even in like the first course, they, they have you basically training and building your own image classifiers, which is really neat. Total content time there around 14 hours. If you want a book instead, uh, Neural Networks and Deep Learning by Michael Nielsen. Free book, six chapters online, goes into a lot of depth if you prefer reading instead of watching videos or doing courses. Finally, you should look at SageMaker for running this stuff. As I mentioned before, it does a lot. Uh, there's also a free tier uh, on AWS SageMaker, uh, sorry, Amazon SageMaker, so you can uh, get started for free if you've never used AWS before and you're interested in, in, in playing around with it. These demos, both the, the two web apps I built and the Jupyter Notebook that runs all this, is all on GitHub, so you can look at those too. Machine learning's for everyone. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Don't feel like I can't do this stuff because I don't understand the math or the jargon or whatever. That's BS. You can. Spend a little bit of time reading the docs and, and looking at the bajillion examples in SageMaker and build something tomorrow or this weekend because you can and it's really fun. So what will you build? I hope you will keep in touch and tell me. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that was quite long. Okay, um, we got time for about three or four questions. So the one in the back. Uh, before you ask your question, if you could just tell me your name and where you're from, because I like to know who I'm talking to. Please. Oh, um, that's what? Singapore. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you do you work do you work somewhere? <laughs> okay, cool. What's up, Stanford? I would just like to ask, um, so for those 30 images and things, right, uh, is your code there actually doing data augmentation already? Okay, um, so let me unpack that for the people who aren't familiar with what data augmentation is. Um, the, the question, by the way, was, uh, I don't know if the, the recording picked it up. Mike, do you, do you have the, these mics going into the audio? Do I need to repeat the questions? No. Good. Okay, data augmentation is a concept of saying, if you don't have a lot of data, like my 30 images only per class, more data is better than less data. And you know, if I take a picture of my face, and we look at my face, and I flip it, and so it's like my face in the mirror, it's still a face, right? Or if I tilt it like five, 10 degrees one way or another, or I, you know, I put some noise, I make it a little grainy like it was taken at night, it's still a face. We all recognize that as faces. We can apply these sorts of augmentations uh, programmatically to our data set to make even more data to train from. I didn't do any data augmentation for this. The answer is no. Okay, um, Walter from Taiwan. And Where do you work? Sorry? Where do you work? Uh, I'm working at a startup uh -huh. and I uh, have a, like a, a month off okay. and have to travel around. Cool, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and I just saw this event on Meetup, so I just buy in. And I appreciate your explanation, but uh, I searched a lot of like a, a little bit course or like information on online about a neural 
that what it's all about the image. It's like recognize the image. Is there no other like a implementation in different category? Are there other are there other ways to do interesting things with neural networks besides image classifiers? Is basically yes. what you're asking. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, trying to think. Well, I mean. Everything I showed you at the beginning, right? Um, so let, two of the examples at the beginning uh, were face detection and object recognition, right? Those are both you, you could think of as like being in the field of image classification. Um, but self-driving cars, right? Um, I don't know this for sure, but I would be willing to bet and have somebody prove me wrong that uh, your auto self-driving uh, cars that, that are on the road today, right, in the autopilot modes, uh, are using deep learning uh, models under the hood. Today, ha! Huh, no pun intended. Under the hood, that was funny. <laughs> it's not just about that because, like, uh, there's other input that comes into the network too, right? There's lidar uh, sensory input that's not. It's not in, in image data, right? There's the how fast are you moving, and you know what inputs should I be making to the car, for example, in order to, to safely steer it in the direction I want to go. There's more than one way to turn a corner uh, and start and stop at the same place, right? But like, you know, how you're gonna if you're gonna take it fast or slow might also depend on what road conditions you, you think there is based on you know the RPMs of the tires for a given velocity, et cetera. All that stuff could be input into the network where it's figuring out what's relevant and what's not. Um, the other one I gave you an example of was sentiment analysis, right? So uh, you could apply machine learning or deep learning to sentiment analysis as well if you wanted to. For like, is this a positive tweet or these ne negative tweets, et cetera. Another question. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, it's very simple. What's your name and where do you work? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. I have My questions name first. Is Lynn. Hi, My Lynn. My name is Lynn. I work in Singapore. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I talk to the screen all the time. So that's precisely what I do. So the first. First part of the question is because uh, image classification uh, by and large is well defined contour. So my first part of the question is about defined contour as what you have specified, like a human, like an object, blah blah blah. So take Eiffel Tower for instance. Mm. Uh, if you go to the internet, you you look for Eiffel Tower, you get like 10,000 pictures easily. Uh, and some pictures actually look like Eiffel Tower. They are not at Eiffel Tower in Paris. So they look alike. The one in China is yep. about 10 times bigger. Yep. So talking about that, they have Venice and all every other fake city in the world, replica in down to the last detail. Sure. So how do you then tell from which country? So this is about well-defined images. So the second part of the question is about undefined. So things that don't have a contour or like water. Why I bring out this subject, uh, there's actually a lot of classification of images in this uh, area. Typically, one question is, uh, currently there's a branch of science, it's called environmental DNA. Uh, and this is very important because from I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you in the, in the interest of time because I, I, it sounds like there's a lot of relevant background here, but to respect everyone else's time here, uh, let me just answer the question as you've asked it. Without, I don't need to know the background about why it's an interesting question. I already think it's an interesting question. Uh, and if you want to tell me more about the background afterwards, tell me afterwards. Is that all right? Can I just answer your question? So the second part of question is, is about undefined. Yep. Uh, that means Things that don't have entity, obvious contours. Yeah, doesn't mm -hmm. have a contour. Yep, I understood. So, uh, like water. Yep. So you, if you have one thousand rivers and twenty thousand spots of a lake or an ocean, blah blah blah. I yeah. want to know. This, okay, I think you know what my question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so your first question was about uh, fakes, uh, right, or replicas of an image, and how do you tell which one is it? Which one is it? Is it the Eiffel Tower replica in China, or is it the real Eiffel Tower in Paris? I have two questions about that. What is the real Eiffel Tower, right? Like they're both the Eiffel Tower. Um, no, Eiffel Tower so, is just because it's by, by Dr. Eiffel. Right, it looks like an Eiffel Tower, it's an Eiffel Tower, right? Uh, duct typing in the real world. If it looks like the Eiffel Tower, and, and, and then it is the Eiffel Tower um, from an image classification perspective. If you wanted to know specifically which Eiffel Tower it was, you would probably need to have a more uh, rich data set, like perhaps the GPS data from the EXIF file uh, on the image. Exactly. I think it's obvious too. Uh, your second question was about uh, 
can these sorts of techniques classify images without well-defined contours well, like lots of bodies of water, for example, right? rivers and lakes and stuff? I don't know. Uh, will you try this yourself and let me know? I'd be really interested to know how it works out. Uh, we don't have any time for any questions, so uh, thank you very much all for coming, and thank you Gabe once again for that. Thank you so much for the opportunity, you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, if you would like to.